much for having me and coming. Uh, I just found myself sort of carried away listening to the other three talks, so now I have to bring myself back and think about what I'm going to say. Um, I want to take you back to 1988, uh, grocery industry. Uh, some of you weren't born then, but uh, I want to take you back to that time and have you think a little bit about what was happening in the industry, uh, consistent with some of the talks that we've just heard. In that industry, there were basically three trends happening, which have actually continued through to this day. So around the, the late, mid to late 80s, the grocery industry knew that people were becoming increasingly concerned about their health. So they knew that fresh foods were going to be a thing. People wanted fresh foods, foods without additives. They're concerned about eating healthily. The second thing that people knew at that time was that people were going to start wanting more flavorful foods. Why did they know this? Well, the restaurant industry leads the grocery industry by several years. So around that time, you're seeing a lot of people outside of an ethnic community going to ethnic restaurants. So for example, Mexican food was becoming very popular. You're seeing a lot of Mexican restaurants. You're seeing Thai restaurants. You're seeing Ethiopian restaurants. So people's palates are becoming acclimatized to more uh, tasteful foods. And we know then that those preferences are going to follow into the grocery store when people come to buy their groceries. Last but not least, dual working couples were just becoming a thing. So the momentum was there that there were now sort of a critical mass of dual working couples. What are they concerned with? Convenience. They want convenient foods. So freshness, flavor, and convenience, these are the three trends that were happening at that time. So if you could come up with a product that sort of hit all three of these things, uh, you, you'd be doing quite well. What, what are products that are like that? Well, what about fresh herbs? So this is a small category. Certainly meet the freshness component. Certainly meet the flavorful component. The problem is they're not convenient. So anyone that cooks knows that trying to do anything with herbs is just a nightmare, all right? So if you could find a way to make herbs convenient, then you'd have something. So along comes this company, entrepreneurial company, Evan Kristen Specialty Foods. We're going to come into the picture here. They've been in operation for a couple of years. They've raised venture capital funding from E.M. Warburg Pincus, a very high-end New York venture capital company. They've invested millions. And here's the business model that the company has developed, through, mainly through trial and error market research. They find out that fresh herbs, so they know that people are going to want, if they're going to have a national brand, they need fresh herbs available, a variety, year-round. Okay? People are going to walk into a store and expect to be able to buy their cilantro. They also find out that the only way to get flavorful herbs is to have the herbs grown in the ground outside. So it turns out that when the plants are stressed, they, they increase their essential oils, and it's the essential oils that give herbs flavor. You can sort of grow giant basil leaves in, in a hydroponic setting, but they just don't taste like anything. So the problem that they have is that it's very hard to find a place that has year-round availability of herbs. In fact, there's only one micro-ecosystem in North America, and it's in Monterey, California. And in fact, there's only one farm at, in that area doing this, which is Monterey Farms. So Evan Kristen sets up a production plant right next to Monterey Farms, which will be the source of their year-round herbs. Their facility, which I won't go into, has a number of proprietary, proprietary technology innovations that allow them to process the fresh herbs, de-stem them, wash them, and put them in these uh, little, they look like little strawberry containers. Their market research told them that people associate freshness with strawberries, so the managers of the company put their herbs in like little, little strawberry boxes. Uh, and if you know anything uh, about herbs, of course, they're very delicate. So trying to come up with a process that didn't turn herbs into, into toothpaste, basically, was very challenging. But they, they passed that, uh, that obstacle. The next problem that they had was shipping the stuff from the West Coast to the East Coast. They know from their market research that customers want a one to two week shelf life once they bring the herbs home to their refrigerator. 
Well, if you have to ship herbs by truck, which is normally how produce is shipped from the West Coast to the East Coast, that's a, that's a seven-day trip there. The stuff lands in some uh, store warehouse. Eventually, it gets shipped to some store. When the produce manager orders it, it's going to kill the shelf life. They're one of the very early, I mean, we take this for granted now, but they're one of the very early users of FedEx. Produce manager calls up, says, I need X number of cases of fresh herbs. Stuff gets harvested that day and shows up in the store the next day. They have an in-store uh, proprietary technology in uh, their end aisle display unit. So they know that the stuff has to be refrigerated, but they also know that this is an impulse buy. They know that they don't want people to have to open a refrigerator or reach into some coffin case or something to get their herbs. They want people to just pick them up and throw them into their uh, grocery cart. So they create this end aisle display. This is actually a refrigeration unit that keeps the herbs at a particular temperature. So this is all very well and good. What do they end up delivering? Well, what they're delivering is fresh, flavorful, convenient uh, foods. Basically, for $1, they're selling a tenth of an ounce of herbs. Because they're chopped herbs, they can be mixed. So they can sell a, a Italian mix of fresh herbs. You basically take it home, you open it, you throw it into your jar of ragu spaghetti sauce, and the flavor is just substantially improved. Two-week shelf life, year-round availability, and what are the results? The results are that they're making $80, $80 a pound on their product. There's nothing in the produce uh, area that has anything like that. So if I stick a Dole sticker on a banana and a Chiquita sticker on another banana, and the Dole banana is five cents cheaper, everybody buys the Dole banana. There's no, there's no branding, really, in the produce area. They're, they're dealing on, on margins of pennies. This is $80 a pound. The Economist ran an, an article on these guys and said, you know, the only thing that sort of has this value to weight ratio is Coke, uh, you know, at, at the moment. The other thing that happens is uh, they've test marketed, so we're coming in at the point where they're test marketing in some high-end stores, Gristidi's in New York, King's uh, in New Jersey, at a time when uh, Pepsi or Frito-Lay would consider sort of five to six cases per store per week a, a good success for a new product. This stuff is selling 15 to 20 cases. It's just flying off the shelves. So. Time to pop the champagne corks. The managers are going to be on millionaire row. Test marketing gets done. And the venture capitalist pulls the plug. Mind you, they've invested millions at this point. They pull the plug. They say, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to sell your proprietary equipment to a company that, that, that sells uh, cilantro to Taco Bell, where they fill five-gallon tubs of cilantro and sell it to Taco Bell. Thank you very much. And uh, end of company, and to this day, I keep looking for some similar product to show up at Whole Foods or somewhere, and, and I never do. So what happened here? What, what insight can we have? Um, I work in an area called uh, value capture theory. It's, it's one of my research areas. And what we're trying to do is develop some mathematical models that give us some insight and, and greater precision into thinking about competition. So let me give you a little taste of it. You can read it in more detail in, in the chat. We're not going to do any math, um, but I'll try to give you a little taste of, of what one of the insights is and tied to this example. Basically, if you think of economic agents as little balls of productive potential, you're not going to do badly. So each of you have the potential to create value, and in different ways. I don't have the potential to create value with Lockheed Martin's uh, fighter uh, division that sells stealth fighters to the government, but I do have the potential to decide whether I'm going to buy an iPhone or an Android phone. And when I make that purchase, I'm actually creating value. That phone gets transferred to me. The value is created when I have it. I value it more than the $2 it cost Apple to, to produce in China. I'm paying $1,500 for it, and I still get some utility out of that, right? So imagine that all of these agents, the firm, suppliers, employees, distributors, investors, there's a point before transactions happen that there is the potential to do things, the potential to transact. No value is created yet. The value gets created when the transaction actually happens. 
So the potential to create value, which is myriad, there's a constellation of ways that agents can create value, actually instantiates when transactions happen. So this is where value is actually created. Now the question is, is what determines who gets how much of that value? So I have here transactions between a supplier and a firm and a buyer. Value is created. Well, who gets how much of the value that's created? How is that determined? And the answer is it gets determined at least in large part by competition, but not necessarily completely by competition. So if this firm wants to have these transactions happen in a free market, then it has to prevent these other transactions from happening. In other words, the firm is engaged with transaction partners. In order for them to be the transaction partners, the firm has to ensure that the buyer wants to transact with it and not someone else. And so the buyer has to be persuaded. The supplier has to be persuaded. How is that persuasion accomplished? Well, by giving them a larger share of the value. That's how they're enticed into these transactions as opposed to others. This is sort of our standard understanding of, of competition. This is how we understand. This firm, uh, firm, lower firm, is competing for upper firms, buyers, and suppliers. But there's a symmetry to this. This firm also has other alternatives, may also have other buyers, may also have other suppliers that it can deal with. It has potentials to do other things. And so in order for the buyer and the supplier to induce the firm to transact with them, they need to give up a certain amount of value in the transactions. And so you have this, this balancing act that happens. Essentially, uh, the way to think about competition is in the following way. Suppose that transactions occur that create some quantity of value, we'll say V dollars of value. Then the potentials of the firm to transact, if they are deep and substantial and extensive, then in order to attract the firm into these transactions, its transaction partners have to give up value. This is the competition that's guaranteed to the firm, basically the, the profit, the economic profit that's guaranteed to the firm by virtue of its potential to, do, to create value. But by the same token, its transaction partners have symmetric uh, opportunities, and the firm has to give up some value to them. So think of competition as deciding limits on sort of what your economic performance is going to be. Rarely does competition fully determine what you get. This is a key insight. So the insight is, is that what we all get as economic agents, but in this case we're thinking about a firm in particular, what the firm gets is some amount of value guaranteed by competition, and then some other amount of value that is obtained in ways that you convince people to part with value other than competition. We'll call that persuasion. It's the most obvious label for it. So the firm's profit depends on two things, competition, a guaranteed amount of profit, and an amount that's guaranteed by persuasion. And so a large part of strategy that people are now starting to think about that they didn't think about a few years ago is aligning their strategic portion, which is the x-axis here, which is how much am I investing in the potential productivity of my resources and the potential to create value, that's what's creating competition for me, versus persuasive resources, which is convincing others to part with value that they don't need to due to competitive reasons. And comparing that to the kind of environment that they find themselves in, a highly competitive environment where that interval is very narrow because competition and competitive intensity is squeezing tight the performance range of the firm versus, for example, a bilateral monopoly where two agents are basically just haggling with each other over what the fair split of the value is. So you want to be aligned. The problem with Evan Kristen was this. Remember at the beginning, I said there was one farm in one place that could provide them with the variety of herbs they needed. Everywhere that Evan Kristen was creating value, they had figured out, as many entrepreneurs do, they had done lots of market research. They had figured out to the nth degree what the product needed to be to hit the consumer, 
And man, did they get that right. So they're extracting a lot of value out of the consumer. But the problem is, is everywhere they're extracting that value, there's someone there that they need, and that someone is Monterey Farms. And so uh, this was the problem that the venture capitalists correctly saw as a problem, saying if this thing explodes the way you think it's going to explode and become a national thing, you've got a big problem here because these guys are going to want a bigger share of the value once everybody figures out what's going on. And we're feeling very uncertain about that. Which leads to the last bit, which is competition is operating at every level. There's a market for venture capital. Warburg Pincus could transact and create value by investing in Evan Kristen, or they could do a mutually exclusive transaction, which was to take Evan Kristen and sell it to Delgetti International, which was going to use the equipment to process cilantro for Taco Bell. And in this case, you know, producing for Taco Bell <laughs> went one out, and that's what Warburg Pincus did. So Evan Kristen should have been thinking a little bit more carefully about it, competition on the supply side. They didn't, and, uh, and it cost them. I will say the one bright uh, spot about in this is that one of the managers for this company wound up uh, leaving, so all the managers left because the company was, was uh, basically put down. Um, but one of the managers wound up moving on to create uh, ready-to-eat salads, the next big thing. So there's a little bit of a silver lining there. Thank you very much.